to introduce our dear friend, Lawrence Utenauer. Lawrence has a Master's in Environmental Studies from York University, and he specialized in creating accessible environments for people with disabilities. Lawrence has gone on to earn a number of awards in his field, including a Meritorious Service Medal from the Governor General. His true passion, however, is fishing, which led him to start the Blind Fishing Boat, an initiative to open up the outdoors to people living with vision loss. Lawrence. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't know if this mic is um, on, but it, can everyone hear me okay? We're good? Okay. And, uh, I'm going to talk to you today about, well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, it's always an honor to come out here and meet all you great folks and hear some great stories from the uh, bush. You know, you never get tired of that, that's for sure. And, and it, it's, it inspires me to, to, to challenge new, myself in new directions. Um, like you mentioned, uh, I did this blind fishing boat. That, that really was, you know, I had a passion for this technology about making life more accessible for people with disabilities by taking technology. And then merging that with my passion for fishing, it was, uh, it was sort of like, why didn't I do that before? Because I always, you know, I lost my sight over the years. I was registered blind when I was eight. But it really just, it's been really gradual. In my 20s, I had to um, start to live life without looking. And that meant I couldn't stir in a canoe anymore. I couldn't drive my tin boat anymore. And, uh, and I, I missed that. So then I took my love of technology, put it on my boat, found all sorts of uh, gear, and I've got this little plastic folding port -a boat that I drive with an electric Minn Kota motor. It's got a talking GPS, a talking depth sounder, talking compass, a uh, little sensor on the front of the boat so I don't bump into other people. And it goes about five miles an hour, but you know, it's like just walking around on the water. And there's not a lot you can bump into out there that, uh, you know, it's going to cause problems. The boat is tough as nails. But to have the ability to get out, to get out and on my own, and find my uh, spot, catch some fish, and get back. You know, the hardest part is getting back, right? Because it's easy to leave. <laughs> Finding your way back, it's always interesting. But, you know, and then to get back, you know, it's really a sense of, uh, it brings me right back to my sort of primal instincts, right? Of gathering and hunting and fishing and uh, providing for my family. You know, even if I throw them back, the fish back, it's still, I tell myself I can do that. And I think that's what you people are selling is you're selling that chance to connect with nature and to re-establish that primal instinct of, of being the hunter-gatherer, being the provider, still having that ability to go out into the forest and, and onto the water and, and, and collect food and, and, and capture animals and, uh, and, uh, and just observe, observe nature in its workings and realize our part in nature. And that's so important. And I think, uh, it, it, you know, the population is aging in Canada for sure. And uh, we have a whole bunch of uh, different rights and, um, and, 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 you know, this whole integration idea of that people with disabilities don't need to stay home. They want to be part of the mainstream of life. And like me, they want to do things, right? They want to do and they want to experience. And I have people contacting me from all over the world who ask me, how do I do it? And how do I tie knots? And how do I thread fishing line? And how do I know when, you know, I've, what kind of fish I have on at the end of my fishing line? And on and on and on, you know? And, uh, and so there's a huge, huge population out there, not just people with vision loss, which number uh, one million in Canadian right now, legally blind people, and that number is going up quite quickly as the population ages, but other types of disabilities as well. And, uh, and people want to continue to have this contact. And, and I want to share a little bit about with you today on how you can make that happen through your uh, organizations. And as well, and I had nothing to do with this, I promise, the Ontario government's new regulations on um, customer accessibility. <laughs> no, I, I honest, I didn't tell them to do this. This is their own thing, and they did, weren't thinking about you folks at all. So all the examples you read on the internet about um, customer service accessibility and the new Ontario government regulations really has, you know, there's not a lot of examples that relate to outposts and lodges and fish camps and things like that. So uh, I've had to use a little bit of imagination, but, but it's not hard for me because I, uh, that's part of my life and it always has been, always will be, hopefully. Um, <clears throat> the regulation is coming into force this January um, 
it was came into law last in 2008, but uh, compliance starts this January. And what does compliance mean? And I just want to, don't want to lose my spot here on my little machine. I got some notes here, and I better keep up with that. Otherwise, hang on. Yeah. So the dates is 2000. It's it accessibility. Everyone thinks of wheelchair ramps, accessible washrooms. This isn't about that. So everyone can take a big breath. It's not about rebuilding your lodges, putting in wheelchair ramps yet. That, that may be coming later on, but not right now. What this is about, this is about systemic barriers, attitudinal barriers, and uh, access to information, and uh, those types of issues that just silly things. Just silly things, misunderstandings, lack of information that, that prevent people from either enjoying their stay enjoying the, having a good time, or blocking them all together from having a, that experience. Now, there's two types of organizations. It, it, it does affect all organizations, private and public, but they've broken it, broken it into two groups. So there's one group is anyone who employs 1 to 19 people, and those who employ over 20 people. The only difference, really, is that both groups, whether you are just got one or two or, or 25 employees, you all have to have developed some policies that deal with um, accessibility, training, your staff, and, 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 and how you're going to make sure that people with uh, disabilities that want to come to your operations are going to have a, a good experience. You know, without investing a, a whole lot of money into rebuilding, but trying to deal with a bunch of those soft issues. To make sure that you know people uh, have good uh, good experiences, there's a good attitude, good reception, not a lot of awkward moments. So getting that policy together, getting that training together, all of you have to do that. You all have to get that sort of awareness level raised amongst yourself, your managers, your staff, and your third-party providers. Right? Like if you're hiring uh, guides or or uh, uh, companies to fly your people in, they also have to be a little bit aware of how to. Uh, um, interact with people with disabilities, and and what sort of things you expect, and what the you know in terms of barriers, and making sure that those barriers don't exist for you know that just don't make any sense. Um, the difference is for those who have 20 or more employees, you have to write it down, it, and you have to report on it. Now the reporting thing is pretty uh, not well defined at this point. So what does it mean to report? Um, it's not clear. They're still working on that themselves. But you definitely have to document it. You have to have something in, uh, in writing. If you have 20 or more employees, you have to have it in writing. And that, what you have to have in writing is your policies that deal with, uh, um, and I'll get into with all the things it has to deal with, but mainly training and awareness raising. Now, in, in 2025, we're going to have other standards in place that are going to deal with transportation, uh, employment, um, information technology, like how to make sure your websites are accessible, and, uh, and, and then your built environment. This will be the built environment will be the last standard that comes into place in, uh, in the next 15 years. And that's going to be modifications to the building codes and things like that to make sure that public spaces, the spaces that are accessed by the public, whether it's your private property, but if you're taking guests in, and they're paid guests, that's public, that those spaces have some sort of physical level